Make sure I have the right one open here before we. All right, folks, we're going to start the, uh, the last talk of the day. Uh, so please welcome Ryan Thompson. He's going to be speaking about uh, building efficient operations dashboards. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank anyone who's still here. It's the end of the day. Uh, I'm not talking about ChatGPT or large language models. I'm talking about dashboards. And if you've made it into this room, um, God bless you, right? Dashboards are not the sexiest thing, but I'm gonna to try to give some tips on building operational dashboards and hopefully some takeaways that you can take back to your teams. So with that said, let's talk a little bit about me. If you notice, that's a picture of me. Um, I'm a security researcher at CrowdStrike and I've held various roles over the years, but in every single role, uh, there has been some instance of Kibana. One of those roles, to be fair, was working at Elastic, so naturally you're gonna get some Kibana there as well. Um, so just so you know, there's gonna be a lot of screenshots of Kibana, a few of Splunk, but I'm trying to make this advice high level and agnostic enough that it can be used across multiple sims. So there's gonna be a slight bias towards Kibana. With that said, what are we gonna talk about? More importantly, we're not going to talk about log ingestion, parsing, uh, individual analysis of logs, hey, this sim's really got a really cool module. Um, we're not gonna get into those details. So just getting that out of the way, uh, that's a great conversation for beers afterwards. We can talk about that. We can argue about you know, what naming schema you should be using for your parsers, which to be fair, I don't have strong opinions about, but we can chat. Having said that, what I will be talking about is guidance on planning and building dashboards. So we're not gonna get super, super in the weeds. If you came here for a, hey, I click here, I select this drop down. This isn't quite the talk. We're gonna be a little bit more high level. We're gonna talk about some, some guiding principles. So with that said, here's the agenda. We're gonna look at dashboards at a high level. What, what are our goals here? We're gonna be talking about some pillars of dashboards excellence. That's a little cheesy, but these are some guiding principles that are gonna follow us through the rest of the, the conversation. We're actually gonna talk about building some of those dashboards. What steps do you need to take? Who should be building them? some quality and life improvements, and then we'll wrap it up with a mini rant session about some dashboard sins. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, quick question, how many of you have Kibana or use Kibana in your current role? Let's see, we got some hands up. Um, how many of you have another sim of, maybe that's up here, maybe that's not, you've got another hand raised from the same company, right? So everyone has these sims. Some vendor has come out and said, you got a lot of logs. I've got a solution for you. And whether or not that solution is right or not, you need to be pulling these in. They are right about that. Um, so you've got this pile of logs. So what happens next? Well, you've got a search bar. Your engineers have done, a, hopefully, a good job of parsing these, ingesting all this information. Um, and now you throw that to your analyst, and your analysts have this empty search bar. They don't know the fields that have been parsed. They don't know the syntax, um, especially if you have a high turnover in a SOC. Um, you're likely what's gonna happen is there are gonna be one or two people who really take to this, they dive into it and become your experts. I know this because I've been that expert at a few companies and they're the go-to and they become a bottleneck, right? This is what happens. Um, whether it's Elastic or whether it's Splunk, right? You've got this search bar here. Splunk is even more uh, unforgiving in my opinion. You have to know some syntax to get started. At least Kibani can punch that search button and get some results back. So this is not a great place to be. Um, for a company or for an analyst. And so, of course, I'm, I'm proposing this question, what's next? If I'm giving a presentation, I'm asking a question, clearly I've got the answer, right? So the answer is gonna be dashboards. We're going to lower that, that bar. I wanna talk about types of dashboards real quick and specifically which ones we're gonna focus on. So there are what I consider exhibit dashboards. These are the ones that you see in stock images of cybersecurity, right? There's like things going across a map, there's pew pew maps, it's hanging at the front of a SOC and, and the, you know, either your, your customers come in on a SOC tour or your management comes in, they start to say, yeah, this looks really good. You got pie charts and, and all this, right? That's not what we're talking about today. The other type of dashboard would be a monitoring dashboard. So, hey, I wanna know when things are on fire. I want this dashboard to light up red. And I, and I think these are definitely more valuable than the first type. Also not what we're talking about though. 
What we're talking about is operational. So I have questions of my data, either an alert has gone off or there's an incident, I need to go ask questions of it. And this is used uh, mainly for uh, investigation uh, deeper into your data. Now, could you do that with a raw search? Sure, but there's a high barrier to entry to that. So the, the whole purpose of this is to lower the barrier to entry of asking questions of the data. That's what we're, that's where our goal is here through all of this, through all of the different widgets I talk about and some of the techniques, uh, that's what we're doing. So with that said, let's dive into some of these pillars. These are guiding foundations and, and it goes beyond what I think I cover here. Uh, but I think they're really important to consider as you're building these out and structuring these. So first of all, we have consistency, interconnectivity, and manageability. Those are the three pillars, and we'll talk about those a little bit. First up is consistency. If you go to a major website or you open a major application, think about Microsoft Word or Amazon's homepage. You know that if you want to go to the homepage of Amazon, that little smile button is always going to be in the top left. If you want to view your cart, it's always going to be in the top right. No matter where you navigate, there is some level of consistency to where you can build some muscle memory. So that's gonna be vital. Um, that's gonna be uh, something that's gonna connect all of your dashboards together. Speaking of that, interconnectivity. Um, quite frankly, no sim out there that I've used at least has a great navigation pain for uh, navigating between your dashboards. You, you go up to the hamburger menu, you find dashboards, you click and then Oh, damn, this is the worst part, right? You've got everyone who's named all their dashboards over, over time, and there's like copy, 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 copy of different dashboards. We've all seen it. Um, I've seen it every company I've worked at. And so let's figure out how we can remove that friction of pivoting between dashboards. And, and realistically, it's going, to be, it's going to feel more cohesive at the end of this as it's a, a set of data. And, and we'll talk about that more. Last one I don't have any screenshots for, but this is just a good principle in general manageability. Anytime you can create and save an element and then reuse that element across multiple dashboards, that is going to save your bacon when you need to make an update. That means you update it in one place and it spreads out across all of your dashboards instead of having to go to each individual one. And so this is going to be huge. We'll talk about a little bit on, on how you can do this. All right, so let's get into building these dashboards. Once again, we're not going to do a click by click. It will be slightly Kibana leaning but these are still the steps that need to happen no matter where you're building it at. So first up, we're not gonna build anything. We're gonna go explore our data. This requires somebody who not only knows the SIM to some degree, um, but also knows the source of that data. So if you're building AWS dashboards, you can't really choose somebody who knows Splunk well, but doesn't know anything about AWS. You need a subject matter expert, whether you hire one or whether you have one in pocket, this needs to be the person. This is not an entry level task. And so we need to sift through those raw logs, understand how they're parsed, how our engineers have laid things out. And you'll notice in this raw log here, uh, I, I don't know if you guys can read that in the back, um, but this is the field user type. And in this individual field, uh, the value is I am user. And that's great for this log, but you also need to be aggregating and saying, what are all the possible values for this, this individual field? This is going to tell you so much about your data. And so take that time, aggregate on individual fields, learn what is available before you even start building anything at all. What you're gonna find is that most of these logs have a tiered structure or a hierarchical uh, structure to them. And so up top you have log type. So in this case, we're talking about CloudTrail. Underneath that, you're gonna notice that they're broken up into event categories or I think CloudTrail calls them event sources. And so in this case, they're broken up by individual services. You have EC2, you have IAM, and then underneath that you have event names, right? So figure out that structure for your logs, whether it's GitHub, Okta, Windows, AWS, whatever it is, learn that structure. This might be a good way to build out your dashboards. That's how I generally do it, but it's not the only way. What, another thing you'll notice is that there's gonna be some fields that go across all logs, right? So for AWS, it would be something like source IP address, it's gonna be uh, event name, right? These are gonna exist everywhere. This will come back into play later. As you get down into the more specific logs for run instance, there's obviously gonna be an instance type, right? Whereas maybe in create policy, there probably won't be that field. So we'll talk about what we do with those specific fields versus the more generic ones. 
I'll touch on this briefly. Windows has a very similar structure. Uh, in this case, you have got the Windows event log broken down by security system, there's application, there's a few different others, and then they break down into individual event names. So understand that for your logs. Next up, we're gonna wanna build our navigation bar. This is the piece I feel like most dashboards are missing, and this is gonna help with that cohesiveness across your different dashboards. So question is, that's great, Ryan, you'd say build a dashboard navigation bar. How do I do that? Most sims out there have a markdown widget or markdown visualization option. And the syntax for link is super easy. Brackets text, right? Whatever text you want to display, followed by the URL. That's it. And so you can build this navigation bar out. Remember, build it once and reuse that element. So if you ever need to add to it, you can add it in one place and it propagates throughout your dashboards. But be careful because most of our environments, most of our sims are controlled by IT. And sometimes they like to move to new domains, whether that's cost savings, whether it's consolidation, whether it's just you know, uh, moving to a new host for stability reasons, whatever it may be, do not use your full domain, whether that's an IP address, whether it's a domain name, because that will come to bite you. What's gonna happen is they're gonna update that domain or update the IP address if it's running locally and all your links will break. So make sure you figure out how to uh, cut off that domain and start grabbing from somewhere else. So for Elastic, I've had a lot of luck grabbing after the pound sign, uh, and then for Splunk, just after the port, right? Use those as your links. It'll automatically navigate and it'll update as you change IPs or domains. So it's gonna help you a lot. This navigation bar, pretty straightforward. You're gonna build these out to link to individual dashboards. So I have overview, IAM, sign-in, compute, and storage, and all those link to their individual dashboards. So pretty straightforward, nothing crazy so far. If you have more than one data type, you may wanna build uh, what I call a global nav bar. So this one is specifically for AWS, but maybe you have multiple, multiple data types. Maybe you have AWS, Azure, O365, GCP, whatever it may be, build that global nav bar along the top, have those linked to your overview dashboards for each of your services. And what ends up happening is you end up putting two nav bars on every type of dashboard. So for an AWS dashboard, you need your global dashboard there and you need your AWS dashboard. For Azure, the kind of the same thing. And this will make a lot of sense once you see the navigation actually work. Up here in the top right, you'll notice that I'm clicking through different AWS services and now I'm gonna pivot over to GCP and it feels very cohesive. So I can put a lot of different links in a very small, small area. And so really, really handy. Now that we're on this slide, let's talk about the header in general. This is that consistency, consistency piece that I talked about. Um, first thing that I feel like a lot of people overlook besides the nav bar is the title widget up here. When I land on this, I need to know what it is. And sometimes I need additional context. So maybe I've filtered in a certain way. Maybe I want to have information on how to ingest new logs, whatever it may be. You can put some small instructions up there in the top left. Also, I'd like to have just a general count of logs so I know what I'm working with. Maybe a histogram of when these logs are coming in, some very generic stuff. Remember, this is up towards that higher hierarchy. We need just general uh, kind of generic fields that exist across all of our logs. It, cool thing about it, it doesn't matter how you design it. These are the same five widgets reorganized in different ways. Figure out what makes sense for you. The reason I suggest that we do this early is because you'll likely want to build it and then clone it, right? And then maybe replace those with the specific services that you want. Um, but figure that out soon. It's going to take some time. You're going to be dragging some things. You're going to be making sure that things are even. If you change it later down the road, it's a lot of work, but have it consistent. It helps a lot. So a few tips on this. First of all, design it for a 1920 by 1080 screen. If you've got a 49 inch monitor and you're spreading out your Kibana and you're saying, yeah, this looks great. When somebody opens that up on their laptop, they're gonna hate you. It's gonna be awful. And so design it for a standard screen size. The recommended elements I have up here, I'd have some type of title pane up there, let them know where they're at, provide details, maybe a count of overall records, whatever makes sense for your organization or your data. So next up, step four. This is that manageability piece, and this is a really important piece. Um, when you build a widget, it generally asks, what is your data source? And most people say, cool, I want that raw data. Give me that AWS index pattern. Give me um, all of the Windows logs, whatever it may be. And then in each visualization, 
people end up putting filters in there and they say, oh, well, this is uh, specifically uh, user logins. And they'll go and they'll, they'll adjust that visualization. They'll create another one and they'll put those same filters on. And they'll create another visualization, put those same filters on. Anyone who's managed anything at scale knows this is gonna be a huge problem, right? As you, if you decide that you, your definition of this type of activity has changed, you need to go change each and every filter. I'm gonna tell you right now, you're gonna miss one. And the worst part is nobody's gonna notice. Nobody's gonna notice for a long time, if ever, uh, because when you start talking about dashboards, things are abstracted. You're not looking at raw logs anymore. And so you will miss that. A better way to do that is to build and save a search with the filters built in. So filter that centrally and then reuse that data source over and over and over again. Kibana allows you to do that first uh, mistake. If you wanted to choose an index pattern, you absolutely could, but I would definitely recommend building those individual searches out and using those as your data source, right? Because it's for this data table, it's asking what source do you want to use? Props to Splunk, Splunk does it right. Uh, if you want to build a data source that says, great, choose what search you want to use. It doesn't even allow you to, to choose an index or a database. It says, you better create a search first, and then we'll use that. Once again, if you need to update that definition, you do it in one place, and it propagates through everything. Super, super handy. All right, now we get to build our dashboards. This is, I was going to say the fun part. It's, it's not super fun, but this is where you get to actually add um, some value to these, right? So now you've got maybe four or five different dashboards. You've got your header along the top that's got some generic information. Now we can move further down that hierarchy and say, great, I want to build out some visualizations just looking for VM launches, just for these run instances, or just user logins, whatever it may be. And so you can build these specific to the, those types. You'll notice that my dashboard isn't very flashy. I'm a sucker for, for data tables. I think if you're, you're trying to ask questions of your data, you need to bring your data forward. Visualizations can be useful. I'd use them sparingly, and I'd usually use them for time series things. So changes over time, amounts of data over time, and I'd be careful about how we use these. I think bar charts are great if you just wanna look at a total count and it's a pretty simple amount, perfect for that. Line charts, fantastic at comparing values to one another. Area charts are a little tougher. Think of who you're building this for. Odds are you're building it for people who aren't as experienced with data visualization or data analysis, and it's really easy to misinterpret area charts. They look really pretty. They're great for things like NetFlow, um, but if you're not very trained in this, you could very easily see this purple up here and decide, oh man, that purple is spiking like crazy, right? When in fact, it's actually the red that's causing it to move up because it's, it's stacked on top of each other. So be careful with that. Um, NetFlow, things like that would be good. Bytes in, bytes out may work for that, but use that sparingly. Markdown is gonna come back again and again. Use these markdown visualizations to break up your dashboards. So if you're building some visualizations out about run instances, build a divider. Visually distinguish it from other sections. It's going to make it flow a lot better. It's gonna make people understand instead of just having a sea of data tables, there's some visual break in, in the noise. So those are the foundations for, for building these out. But let's talk about taking it to that next level. How do we make these truly easy to use and uh, useful for our users. First up is hyperlinks. Uh, anytime somebody is copying and pasting a value out of your dashboard and having to paste it in somewhere else, let's see if we can reduce the, those amount of clicks, right? So in this case, we have source IP or source host that has an IP address. If we need to do a reputation check for that, what we should do is instead of leaving that and leaving that up to the analyst, we should go and edit that field. Most sims allow you to do this. Instead of just having a value up there, you can say, great, my type is gonna be URI or link, and you put it in a template. You say, great, I wanna use telusintelligence.com, and at the very end, uh, instead of having an IP address, I'm gonna have the value of this field. And so what ends up happening is you get a hyperlink, and you click it, and it takes you right to Talus' website with that IP brought up. Reduce that barrier, reduce the friction to, to having those analysts do the right thing. If they're having to copy and paste all day, that's gonna increase burnout. Number of clicks is a whole nother thing, but uh, just reduce that friction. It's not just IP addresses though. That's the first one up there. But there's also things like Windows Event ID. If you create a link that takes you right to ultimate Windows security and pulls up that log right there, the odds of your analyst clicking that and learning that quicker, is gonna be much, much higher. 
But I think the most important one that I've seen is generally speaking, we're pulling this information in from somewhere. Um, a lot of the time we have internal ticketing systems that we're pulling this data in from, or we have internal uh, data systems that we're pulling it in from. And uh, Kibana probably isn't our only place to find information about this or your SIM, right? And so if you're pulling in service tickets, go ahead and create that link, your internal link to that internal service ticket. Um, I've built a handful of these for uh, CrowdStrike. And so we've got internal systems all over the place. And if I can make it a one click to go from Kibana, that data analysis to the actual system that it comes from, that's another huge win. So don't sleep on that. Next up is documentation. Uh, in my opinion, wikis are where documentation goes to die. It just gets buried under everyone's good idea of, of what documentation looks like. It's buried under dead links. It's awful. Um, and so why don't we build that using Markdown widgets? Once again, I want that documentation to be as close as possible to the analysts when they're going through this. And so you're pivoting, you're going through and you're saying, man, you know, I, I really wish that I could build a better search. What are the fields for this environment? Well, I've got a help button up here. I click that and it takes me to a slightly different structure here, right? I've got it built more like a wiki with my links on the right hand side, um, but I've got all my documentation right there. So once again, removing that friction is huge. Last but not least, uh, including raw data in your dashboards is huge. So uh, as it typically stands, you have your dashboards and then you have a raw log search. Those are separate entities. And so if you're looking on your dashboard and you decide, I wanna dive into this deeper, you need to somehow either pin that filter or copy that filter and go over to your raw logs and search again. And not every uh, SIM solution is gonna offer what I'm about to show, but once again, Kibana does, and I know there's others out there that does. Once you save that search, in your raw logs, you can actually include it as a widget in the bottom. So I'm gonna filter on something here, run instances, I'm gonna scroll down and right in my dashboard, I can go look at the raw logs. Once again, removing that step. Now I can apply other filters that I haven't called out in my aggregations. It's ridiculously valuable. And so anytime you can combine that raw data with your dashboard, it's, it's a big win. All right, I get to rant a little bit here. This is the fun part. Some dashboard sins that I found. I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but inconsistent naming conventions. Odds are, this is what your Kibana dashboard looks like, uh, your, your list of dashboards looks like. It's, oh, hey, Robert made this hacker dashboard and everyone's just copied it and put their name on there and it's, it's a complete shit show, let's be honest. Um, what we wanna do is we wanna provide some consistent naming convention. Um, some of the sims allow you to create a different space inside of that sim, so you can have a fresh environment with no dashboards, right? You can build out your set there, or once again, we have a nav bar, so most people aren't coming to this. What we want though, especially for visualizations, you're going to have a lot, some consistent naming conventions so you can find them easily. And so what I usually do is I usually do platform, followed by the dashboard that it's on, followed by some level of consistent naming convention, followed by in brackets, the type of visualization itself. It's a lot of work. Uh, if you decide to do this halfway through, you gotta go back and update them all. It's worth it in the long run. So now if I'm building out a new dashboard, I can say, great, I'm gonna search for EC2 table, and then I have all of my EC2 tables. It's worth the time, put it in. All right, last in here, this is one that I was super guilty of. One dashboard to rule them all. This idea that, hot damn, I can bring all my information together, I can put it in one place and I can just step back and say, are we breached? Um, it doesn't quite work like that. You need to have different dashboards for different, uh, different environments. And so the problem with it is, is in this case, I have multiple different uh, data sources down along the bottom. When I go and put a filter in, what's gonna happen is I'm going to blank out the majority of my visualizations. What's even worse, if you do a negative search, it'll give you results that you don't expect. Uh, that's a longer conversation about that, but just trust me, if you do a negative search on, on one, uh, or a negative filter on one data source and you have others, you're gonna get some results that are gonna be a little bit wonky. All right, and actually I lied. We have one more, one more sin, probably the most fun one, pie charts. Pie charts are awful. Uh, they're, they're, they're just the worst, and, and we'll go into why, and, and more importantly, if the pie chart was the only option, I would say go ahead and use it. I'm gonna make the argument that you can probably find better ways to visualize that data. 
So first up is the pie chart that has more than three or four elements. I don't know about you, but I can't tell what any of these are down in this small yellow section. All right, sure I can mouse over them and it's gonna highlight things. It's just, it's not a good, it's not a good visualization to show a ton of different data types. And so over on the right hand side, we have a data table, which you know has a special place in my heart. Uh, not only do I have the, all the IP addresses clearly listed with their percentages, but I also have the actual count. And so once again, this is operational. We need to be able to filter on those outliers. A data table is gonna allow you to do that much better. You may be saying, but Ryan, what if you only have a few? Still not worth it. Don't ever use pie charts. Um, at first glance, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to tell which one's bigger, the blue or the green. The whole purpose of this visualization is to reduce that ambiguity, to make it very clear what's happening. I'm gonna argue that a bar chart does that way better, even with just a few different values. Uh, and then of course, you've got the trusty data table uh, holding strong for me down there. So I would argue that pie charts are never the answer. Uh, I'm, I'm going on a tour just to, just to rant about pie charts. Get them out of there, they're awful. Um, so with that said, we talked about kind of those pillars, right? We wanna have things that are consistent, we want them to be interconnected, and we want them to be manageable and scalable. That's a huge piece. We talked about the steps of building the dashboard. We're gonna start by exploring that data, building out the nav bar and the header, uh, designing smart data filters, and then finally building the dashboards themselves. Quality of life improvements, make those hyperlinks super easy for your analysts to get from one thing to another. Documentation, build it right into your tool. Include that raw data close to the, the dashboards. And then finally, dashboard sends the most fun part. Name your things consistently. Split up your data sources and avoid pie charts. So with that said, um, I, I do have a, an example of some of these. They don't follow all of the steps uh, that I did up here. There are some sins that, that I included in my own. This was built uh, in the middle of a SANS course. And so I built this specifically to uh, work with Soft Elk. And so if you want to go take a look at what this looks like, I've got a link to it there. Um, it's not, not flawless, it's not perfect. Uh, I'm merely human. So uh, with that said, does anybody have any questions? Uh, I think we need a microphone. Is this it right here? Yes. So um, the documentation piece, I wanted to ask you a little more about, um, I guess, what level of documentation would you expect there? And is that your single source of truth? Or are you pulling documentation from the wiki that's the sin? Um, you know, would you, would you have that be static or uh, have that be maybe pulling from an API that from Confluence or something? How, how would you generally? Yeah, um, typically these markdown uh, widgets aren't built in a way to, to enable that. Uh, I'm sure you could do it on the back end because every widget you saw here lives in some hideous JSON file uh, on the Elastic server, right? So I'm sure you could connect those two. Um, typically, I would just recommend if you're, you know, if you think about it, right, for a Kibana instance or a Splunk instance, whatever it may be, all the engineering and parsing that is happening is specific to that instance. You're not using it anywhere else. So I wouldn't put it in a wiki, I wouldn't put it in Confluence, I would manage it directly within the tool itself. So you're just talking the documentation for using the tool? Correct, yeah, not documentation across your entire org, that definitely needs to live somewhere else. But, um, and, and specifically, right, you take Kibana for instance, I'm not gonna document how to use Kibana. Elastic's already done that, so I'm gonna talk specifically about my instance. I'm gonna give example queries. I'm gonna give frequently asked questions. Hey, why is this timestamp weird? Hey, here's the engineering reason behind that. Here are the field names to use for this instance. So yeah, not all documentation. Definitely don't wanna, don't wanna say move everything into Kibana, but the things that make sense for that instance. That's a great question though. Thanks for the clarification. Um, would you uh, would you say that the decision to create a, a dashboard? Yeah. Um, are you starting with the data, a question about the data, something else? Like, what's the process of saying no? This should be a dashboard versus this should be in a different dashboard, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's going to depend for everyone, right? Um, the way that I typically do it is I do it. I try to build it along the same lines as the hierarchy. 
So if there's if they have a category log or a category field, that's typically what I use for my, my different dashboards. But that doesn't have to be the case. You could build one for root activity, or you could build one for a specific event ID if you wanted to. You can get as granular as you want. And so it depends on your use case. Um, typically what I'm building for is um, somebody who wants to ask additional questions or really, uh, if, if we really break it down, they're just pivot tables, a lot of these, right? You wanna say, great, for this user, what events happened? Or for this event, what users did it? And so it really depends on your organization. I typically do it by that category log. Um, it's gonna vary though, yeah. Any other questions? All right. With that said, thank you guys so much for your time and sticking around. Appreciate it.